you have any uh, theories or any um, have you you know uh, encountered any evidence as to what the pyramids might have been for? Because the mainstream view is that there that there were tombs for their emperors, um, but uh, mm. I believe that they've never found any actual. There's never been the body of a pharaoh found sure. in any of the pyramids uh, of Egypt. So the, the question is, you know, what? And even what when they, they did find one uh, intact chamber, uh, when the chamber was opened and the sarcophagus inside it was open, it was found to be empty. Right. What's going on? You know, the idea that these are tombs. I'm afraid that's a projection of modern ideas about the past onto the past. It isn't the past actually speaking to us. Well, I have to get a little mysterious here. Um, ancient Egyptians themselves saw, saw themselves as um, the inheritors uh, of a much more ancient system of knowledge, uh, which they believed had been handed down to them by the gods. And there are texts uh, the Edfu building texts, so-called because they're inscribed on the temple of Edfu. Uh, and those inscriptions say that they were set on that temple to preserve them, copied from a much earlier book, which is, which is lost. Uh, those speak of, a, uh, of an island on which the gods lived. And they tell us that that island was flooded and that many of the gods died but that there were survivors and that those surviving gods came and settled in Egypt and made it their land in a remote period that the ancient Egyptians call Zep Tepi, which is the first time. It's a rather emo emotive idea, really, that there was this first time when everything began in Egypt, and it was begun by gods who came to Egypt from a flooded homeland. So similar, in a way, to the story of Atlantis that is passed down to us by Plato. And by the way, um, Pl Plato is the earliest surviving specific mention of Atlantis, uh, but he tells us that he got the information from an earlier Greek Solon, who in turn got it from the ancient Egyptians. So these things begin to, begin to come together. Mm. Now, what's fascinating about the ancient Egyptians with this, what they believe to be a very old system of um, spiritual ideas that was passed down to them by, by the gods, um, is that their whole focus is on how we lead our lives right in order to secure our immortal destiny. Many scientists today will tell you that there's no such thing as life after death. They say we're just meat, our consciousness is simply an accident of this meat, and that uh, when we die we rot and we're gone and there's nothing left. But actually that's not a fact. That is a scientific religion. That is a belief system. No scientist has actually died, seen nothing, and come back and reported it. There are no experiments, no evidence. It's just an opinion of science. And I think when we want to deal with such matters as the soul and the possible survival of, of, of uh, death by consciousness, we need to listen to the masters in this field. And the masters in this field were undoubtedly the ancient Egyptians who devoted their best minds for thousands of years to thinking about nothing else than this. And uh, they, they believed that, uh, that there was a certain way to live life, that, we were, that, that to be born in a human body was a precious gift, uh, that we had an obligation to use that gift in every possible way, to learn everything we could, to live full lives, to live generous and, and decent and good lives. And part of this system, uh, I believe, uh, were, were the pyramids, the, uh, and, and the Great Pyramid of Egypt uh, specifically. The ancient Egyptians believed that after death we make a perilous journey through a realm that they called the Duat, uh, the netherworld, if you like. And in that journey we're confronted by tests where every moment of our lives will be weighed up and, and, and assessed. And they depict it as a place of narrow corridors and passageways and huge chambers. Uh, sometimes guarded by monsters into which the soul enters. And when you look at those depictions, you find that um, the Great Pyramid is a three-dimensional model of this afterlife realm. Could it have been a place of preparation uh, for the afterlife journey, which our scientists in their ignorance dismiss? But hey, what do they know? You know, Let's listen to the people who really knew about this. And they regarded it as supremely important to be prepared for that journey because they said, when we die, it doesn't all stop. We do go on and we will we'll be tested. We will be tested and we'd better be ready. 
for that test. So one thing I believe that the Great Pyramid was part of was part of a, a, a science of immortality, if you like. Uh, I, think it, I think it's more than that. Um, it's also, uh, oddly, uh, a scale model of the northern hemisphere of the Earth. Um, of course, we're used to the Earth as a sphere, which indeed it is, and the Great Pyramid is you know, not a sphere, it's a pyramid. But here's the, the mysterious thing. If you measure the base perimeter of the Great Pyramid, in other words, if you go right round the base of it and measure it, and multiply the result you get by a very specific number, which is 43,200, you get exactly the equatorial circumference of the Earth. And if you take the height of the Great Pyramid and multiply it by exactly the same number, 43,200, you get the polar radius of the Earth. So the dimensions of the Earth were encoded in this fabulously ancient and mysterious monument. We don't know when and we don't know by who, you know? Um, th this is, uh, this is a, again, a suggestion of Earth measuring, of, 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 of understanding the Earth that's going on here. And by the way, that number, and this touches on, you know, you asked about evidence from the past, pieces of technology. This number, 43,200, belongs to a series of numbers. It's not just random. A series of numbers that are found in ancient myths all around the world, and we don't know where those myths come from. Uh, but they all speak about a falling of the skies, um, a, a great change that takes place in the heavens when things begin again anew. Uh, and it's, uh, it's coming to be understood that what these myths are about is an astronomical phenomenon, very hard to observe, called the precession of the equinoxes, which changes the sign of the zodiac against the background of which the sun rises very, very slowly down the ages. Everybody's heard the song, we live in the dawning of the age of Aquarius. It's actually related to that process uh, because we have, the sun has been rising on the spring equinox in Pisces, the fish, for the last 2,000 years, but it's in the process of moving into the next sign, Aquarius. And this is caused by a wobble on the axis of the Earth. It's our viewing platform from which we observe the stars. Naturally, since the platform is changing its orientation, our relationship to the stars changes very, very slowly. And it changes at the rate of one degree every 72 years. And 43,200 is a multiple of 72. Uh, and interestingly enough, the Mayan calendar, uh, which predicts some kind of grand ending taking place on the 21st of December 2012, and an ending of something, let's remember, should always be understood as the beginning of something else. That calendar is also full of this same system of numbers, that, that some ancient culture, uh, what one academic, Giorgio de Santillana, who was a professor of the history of science at MIT, called an almost unbelievable ancestor culture, had observed this process and had accurately encoded it in myths to pass the information down to the future. This is something we need to watch out for. This is something we need to pay attention to. Yeah, I guess, uh, have, you got, have you got a question? Well, I just wanted to mention, uh, when you were talking then about the, uh, the way the Egyptians regarded their gods as having come to them and passed on information. I mean, um, is, there a, is there a feeling that these gods that a lot of the cultures talk about, uh, rather than being, you know, sort of mythical beings, could have actually just been some people of, of a more advanced technological stage that just came to them and that's had his on my, some That's my, my view. I don't insist that my take on the past is correct. Um, what I've tried to do, what my role has been, I think, is to provide an alternative to a massive mainstream view of the past. You know, everybody says it was like this, Let's consider if it might have been different. That's been the, the, the role that I've played. And the conclusion that I've come to is that, uh, that mainstream academia may have missed something huge. Yeah. Uh, they may have missed an enormous forgotten episode in, in, in human history, a lost civilization. And that all of the traditions, such as the story of Atlantis passed down to us by Plato, which is one of just thousands of similar traditions from all around the world, may actually be based on something true, something real. And what those suggest was that there was a former golden age 
high civilization that explored the world, that had amazing technology, that could do things with stone, that we can't even dream of doing today, that understood time, that measured the earth, and that this civilization was destroyed in an enormous cataclysm, a global cataclysm, a great flood, usually it's a flood, often accompanied by earthquakes and volcanic activity in these stories, but that there were some survivors and those survivors settled in certain nodal points around the world, one of which was Giza in Egypt, but I believe Peru, the Andes, were also a, another place where survivors of this lost civilization uh, settled, perhaps also Mexico. Uh, and uh, encountering uh, the primitive peoples who lived there, they then began to spread their knowledge uh, to them. And so the suggestion is that these, is who, these are who the gods were. Yeah. They were the survivors of a lost civilization. That's just my theory. Yeah. I've tried to present evidence to show that it might be the case because there is a whole lot that the mainstream academics are missing. Is there not some, um, some accounts of uh, some of the people of South America actually describing when they were first uh, sort of met, the, the, when they were asked if they built the structures, they said, oh no, we didn't build them. Yeah. Is this, like this is the case. This is the case uh, very, very much so when the, when the Spanish first came to Peru. Um, the Incas didn't really claim to have built all of the stuff that hi later historians have given to the Incas. Yeah. You know, there's the astonishing uh, walls at Sacsayhuaman above, above Cusco. Uh, which, which just is like a huge jigsaw puzzle of gigantic blocks of stone, 50, 60 tons. You stand above them, underneath them, they just tower above you. They're absolutely enormous. They're fitted together incredibly precisely. And then up on top of them are some other structures of much smaller bits of stone. Um, those smaller structures are the ones I believe the Incas built. Uh, the much larger structures the Incas inherited. Uh, from, from an earlier civilization that knew how to do stuff that the Incas yeah. didn't know how to do. Yeah, there are endless accounts like that. Yeah. And I think the story in Giza is very similar, that there are very ancient structures on the Giza plateau and more recent structures that were right. built in historical times. And the mistake of academia has been to hand the whole lot to, you know, yeah. to the more recent civilization and to forget about the older origins, which you know, the Egyptians themselves always were very clear about. They said their civilization was a legacy yeah. Not a development. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Now, I was going to mention there about the, uh, the cargo cults, yeah. which I guess a lot of people might not, not be aware of. Uh, well, I suppose you could probably describe this better than I can. Well, yes, I mean, the notion, the, the, the notion that there have been, it's not a notion, it's within, within living memory when our high-tech culture has uh, made contact with uncontacted peoples on, on islands or in jungles, that actually there, there has been a tendency for our culture to be worshipped as gods initially. Um, and maybe it's the same process which you know has been witnessed anthropologically. We know it takes place. It's called a cargo cult they, you know, because you know cargo was seen to be delivered from heaven, you know, on, on airplanes. Um, maybe that same kind of process was at work in much more ancient times when the survivors of a lost civilization uh, settled all around the globe and began to pass down their knowledge to the future. Yeah. Um, and and um, you know, interestingly. Uh, in that passage down of knowledge to the future uh, is the notion that uh, life on earth may not be all that safe, that there are, that there are dangers that we should be aware of um, and that these dangers are both uh, physical and spiritual. Uh, this is what comes across again and again in the ancient myths, that, uh, that we need to mind our behavior very carefully to make sure we do not uh, fall out of harmony uh, with the universe, because if we fall out of harmony with the universe, then the universe will strike us down. This is, this is so in the story of Atlantis. They were seen to have become proud and arrogant and cruel, and they were struck down with a flood. It's indeed the story in the, of the flood of Noah in the Bible, that, uh, that the flood was, was sent by an angry god because humanity had become so vicious and evil and, and arrogant. And I just think, um, without wishing to put too fine a point on it, that uh, if we look at many of the aspects of modern civilization today, we see the same viciousness, the same cruelty, the same arrogance uh, taking place. And that suggests to me that unless we watch our step, our civilization could actually become the next lost civilization. And we may find in 10 or 20,000 years time that we ourselves are the subjects of myth.